past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of interesting stuff going on. It's... uh. Really fascinating, actually. I'm looking at a company called GameStop. You may have heard of it. You know, I talked about GameStop about two and a half years ago. And I actually went out and bought long-term options to be able to purchase the stock. Okay. But they expired about a year ago. Now, <laughs> this is why options are so hard. I mean, think about that. Stock goes from... $3 a share up to $325 a share. It was pretty low when I bought the options on it. Had I continued to continuously purchase those same options contracts, the, uh, I'd probably be flying over in my personal jet today. <laughs> uh, brother. And everybody wants to know why, what the rhyme or reason is. Well, how could you tell that was going to happen. And the, the reality is you can't, you, you just can't, you can try and you can probably, if, if, if you make money on something like that, you know, pat yourself on the back and because you had good luck, because when you have a stock that has a range of over 50% in a day, when a stock opens 50% higher, goes down 50% right after it opens, then comes back up goes up almost 50% from where it opened, then turns back around and closes more than 50% down from where it had the high point of the day is. If you've made money on that, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredibly difficult. When I'm saying incredibly difficult, I'm, I am understating that by so much. You just, you, you don't understand. <laughs> it's like, you know, winning lottery, close your eyes, you know, spin the wheel. That's basically what people are doing. And uh, so anyway, you can uh, um, say all you want. And I know this, that when you look at the chart on that, everything looks obvious in the past. It always does. Always does. But predicting that future, man, boy, if I ever get that down, <laughs> pretty tough. And in fact, when you see speculation like this and, uh, you know, there are going to be, there are going to be a lot of stories about this. A lot of people who are investing today, a lot of people that were participating in that stock hadn't even been born yet in the mid nineties, mid to late nineties, they hadn't been born and they don't, they don't remember. They've never lived through something like this before. There were an unbelievable number of stocks that were doing this in the late nineties. And there were people going to these day trading rooms where they were quitting their jobs. Some of them had actually even learned a couple of techniques that were extremely profitable until they weren't until the market changed. And then they went broke. Many of them went bankrupt and it, it's an extremely sad thing to see. It, it, it's just a massive bubble and everybody looking at it wishes like crazy 
that they could participate. And then you'll have a whole bunch of other people swearing that they did participate and made a whole ton of money. But you'll notice they're still showing up at work the next day. So what I'm saying there is unless somebody shows you the actual um, confirmations of the buys and sells, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Just uh, people like to do that sort of thing. I'm not sure why. But why well, actually I'm sure why, but probably isn't happening. So and I had a just a ton of people. And by the way, the reason I bought Game Stock or the, the options on Game Stock was because its price to sales ratio was incredibly low. And it was incredibly it's still pretty no, not actually not today it isn't. The um but the I thought it had a chance. And everybody's looking at it going, no, everybody's playing online. They're not going to go into the store and buy a, a console. They're not going to buy the games. And uh, they were actually making more money selling the paraphernalia, you know, these little stuffed animals that were in the games. <laughs> they were making a lot more money selling that stuff than they were selling the games. And they were making more money on the games that people turned in, that the trade, than they were. By the way, you may not have known this, they were also the largest reseller of AT&T mobile service, phone services with 6,000 locations across the country. Uh, everybody I've, that I've personally talked to about this in the last few days who's asked about it was not aware of that. Was not aware that, they've, that they had all those other businesses. And uh, so anyway, it's just, uh, it's just one of those things. And yeah, it's kind of fun. When you're watching something like that happen, and it's a lot more fun for me because I know I'm not going to participate. I'm, I'm just going to be the uh, spectator watching the other people pay their dollar and take their chances. And basically, that's, that's what they're doing. I, I would bet that you're going to see uh, a lot of legislation coming out. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised the, uh, if the uh, SEC, the, the, rules, the rules are going to change. Bottom line is rules are going to change because I'm sure there were an awful lot of people who ended up losing a, a fairly significant amount of money and they weren't sophisticated investors. See, sophisticated investors, you didn't hear Warren Buffett getting on CNBC and talking about this. He wouldn't. He knows better. And uh, a sophisticated investor stays away from this sort of thing. When something detaches from any sort of value that you could actually place on something, that happens a lot in the stock market, by the way. In fact, you know when it happened a lot? Back in the uh, early 1900s. These stocks would go to levels kind of like GameStop did. They would sell at prices that they should. there's no way they should ever sell for. Why would they do that? Well, because it was really difficult to get information. Nobody knew where the company's sales were. They didn't know how much in profit the company was generating. They were just, uh, hey, this stock is going up, let's buy. And that continued all throughout the, the 1920s. And I'm not sure how many people today re have ever even heard the phrase, the Roaring Twenties. But the Roaring Twenties, what they were talking mostly about the stock market. People were getting rich. You only had to put 10% down. It's kind of like buying a mortgage. You put 10%, you could put $1,000 down, which was a lot of money in those days, and buy $10,000 worth of stock. See, here's the problem. The crash of 29 was 11%. It was only an 11% drop. The problem was it happened in a day. And when you, have, when you only have to put down 10% and the market drops 11%, not only did you lose all of your money, you owed 10% more than you had. So if you put all your money into the stock market and suddenly you now you lost it all. And oh, by the way, you owe 10% more than you had. That's a problem. <laughs> and uh, the banks didn't have, there was no FDIC back then. Uh, bank, a lot of bank trust departments were kind of participating in that. They were buying stocks for their clients. So put some of them had them on margin. So the SEC had, wasn't even informed at that point in time. That's actually what caused the SEC to come around. And this is not, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, stuff like this is, is not new. What's worrisome for someone like me is I'm watching this and I'm going, oh, brother, here we go again. 
people are getting so happy. They're getting giddy. They're uh, they're not paying attention to what the share prices should be selling for. They're just buying them because they're going up. Most of them are not selling them, and uh, saying that you know this can only go one way. That that's a little worrisome from somebody who's wa- watched the stock market for a very long time period. That that worries me a little bit because that same euphoria has occurred typically within 12 to 18 months of a big correction. Now, it's not going to be the end of the world. If we get a big correction, it's just going to be painful for a while. But I don't like to see that. Now, the thing that really encourages me, though, is that a lot of the stocks that are coming up on my scans, those normal stocks, by the way, I have a... um, on the scans that I do on, on the stock market, the ones that uh, are published every day on Look Out for the Bull, that's going to be changing, by the way. I think we're going to change the name, give it a new uh, design, uh, and Mike Seeger's going to basically run it completely, and I'll just be a consultant uh, there. But on the scans that come up there every day, these are stocks that have uh, met a certain criteria, and one of the criteria is a price-to-sales ratio. It, it's it's kind of like a price-to-earnings ratio, but price to earnings ratio is, is more, um, it's like you, you do the calculation, you apply it across almost all stocks. You can't really do that with a price to sales ratio. The correct or a, a normal price to sales ratio is going to differ depending on the industry and the kind of profit margins you can expect. I'll talk about that more in a later show. But anyway, we have a on the, part of the screen is that we try to avoid stocks that are extremely optimistically priced. That's why GameStop wouldn't come up on that. Because when GameStop moved up past 30 bucks, it didn't qualify. It was overpriced at that point in time based on our metrics. Now, by the way, it was under three <laughs> in April. So we're trying to avoid, uh, and you wouldn't have to, you don't have to do that, by the way. In fact, the training on the Lookout for the Bull website. We talk about how you can get around that. And uh, I will come back to a lot of this stuff a little bit later in today's show. So if you want to hang around, the last segment, we'll come back and talk about this in more detail. Because I I do really want to uh, talk a lot about, you know, market corrections. Um, This just, boy, just kind of made the hair stand up on my neck a little bit. When you see people getting this euphoric and they're driving prices, and you're like, no, oh, man, that is never good for the stock market. That's just not good. So make sure you've gone and checked your decline tolerances. Make sure your portfolios are in line with your decline tolerance. Now, and by the way, a lot of people are thinking they should jump out. You should not jump out. Okay, you should check your decline tolerance. What is that? Well, it's your, your tolerance for seeing your portfolio drop. Uh, you have to be willing to put up with something. If you don't put up with some fluctuation, you can't make any money. And I, I just ordered the uh, Dalbar study that studies investor behavior that shows how investors do. It's not going to be here till March because they update it once a year. And I didn't want to pay for the old one and then have to pay for the new one right, <laughs> right after that came out. <laughs> but the... Uh, so it'll show you how most investors, are, or a lot of investors, I should say, make up their minds. They watch what happens in the market, and then they make a decision. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to know what you're going to do or be with an advisor who knows what they're going to do ahead of time. You don't watch the market to react. That is a losing proposition And uh, um, for the average person. You know, there are some hedge funds that are some super... Uh, sophisticated. They've got software. They they measure that counts all this stuff. They measure their speed in milliseconds. That's one millionth of a second. Okay, they can do that because that's all they do. They've got billions of dollars, and they have the ability to put in the infrastructure that's necessary to make adjustments on the fly. By the way, the vast majority of them don't do as well as the vast majority of my clients. Think about that for a second. The vast majority of them don't do as well as the average balance fund. So, and they've got all that money. And all those billion—I mean, billions of dollars to spend on all that stuff, and they're still not doing that well. <laughs> that should tell you how difficult that is. 
it is really hard. And if you're going to have an edge, you got to have a plan. And your plan, I mean, the vast majority of, of plans should be well thought out before you put it in place. If you're trying to think of the plan or you're trying to modify the plan as time goes on, you haven't, you haven't planned. I know you think you have, and a lot of you, well, yes, I no. Well, then why are you abandoning your plan? And it doesn't have to be hard. Actually, a rebalancing of the portfolio, typically once every other year, not every year. You don't even have to do it every year. Once every other year is fine. And I know that's really hard for people to, to come to grips with, but you guys don't understand. The funds that you are holding are making adjustments every day but they're doing it by, based on a criteria, on a plan. When a stock, believe me, game stock is not going to make it into a lot of those funds. It doesn't have the profitability to get into one of those funds. Because, well, and, but in, incidentally, in a, in a market cap weighted fund where market cap weighting is the only thing, it's going to get added. And they're going to add to it after it's already gone up like this. <laughs> They're going to be adding to that fund after it's gone up because their rebalancing doesn't happen every day. They don't adjust the, the stock based on its size every day. And the next time the indexes come up, they're going to have to add to that, that stock after it's gone up. That's one of the things I'm not that fond of with just market cap weighted indexing. So when you hear that term, now I get to show you why I don't like that because it's only looking at the share price and nothing else. That's it. And we're going to add to those stocks that have gone up the most. And what are we going to do? We're going to take money out of the stocks that have, that have stayed the same or gone down, which may be a better value. Share price goes down and the business hasn't declined. It's a better value. Why would you sell that stock to add it to game stock? Because you're market cap weighted and that's how that works. That's why I have a job. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times doing the right thing, you're going to look kind of foolish when, when a lot of stocks are going up just because their share price is going up. A lot of momentum funds out there like that. And uh, they'll beat you for a while. Sometimes for two, three years in a row. But eventually that comes back to haunt them. Can't believe I'm uh, at the first commercial break. <laughs> hey, this is Bill Bullington. I'm here right. Uh, I'm here every week on 1420, and I'll be back right after these commercial messages. back and we're just talking a little bit about a lot of different things actually and how the uh, activity in the market recently has been a little worrisome uh, now that I said that I have to tell you the the positive side okay. the value oriented stocks that have been lagging for a very long time have actually started to come forth and, and have been doing fairly well actually they've been doing very well so it doesn't really, um, that part of it is very soothing because you see certain stocks where, yeah, there might be some big time speculation in there, but now you're seeing other stocks and other categories that are coming back and who have been lagging for quite a while and whose valuations are actually very good. So that's very encouraging. Anyway, I'm going to go to the phones right now. If you'd like to call in 216-901-0945 and I got Phil. Is this Uncle Phil? Hey, it is. Hey. <laughs> How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Phil, I know I didn't invent this, but like a couple of months ago, I heard on the radio that I think it was the president at that time said looking into raising the age of RMDs till 75. Have you heard anything about that ever? I, I haven't, but that doesn't okay. mean it's not out there. Um, All right. And they might, you know, it would, um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I know it's gone to 72 already, 
But yeah. the uh, you know seventy five that could be uh, well, that could be a big boost for an awful lot of people. Yeah, yourself included. Yeah, you're not any younger. You know? Right. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'll, I'll yeah, be there the second eventually. Thing, Bill. Yeah, we hope. Yeah, like everybody. And we hope that also um, looking forward to and my question is this year. So in nine, in 2021, we are probably notwithstanding any changes are going to be required to have one of those RMDs. Am I right? By 2021? Yeah, like right now for this year. Well, if you're if you meet the uh, ages, yes. Uh, right. That's what I mean. Yeah. 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 So. OK. Yep. All right. That's all I got. All right. Well, hey, have a good weekend, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Yeah. So, if you'd like to call two one six nine zero one zero nine four five two one six nine zero one zero nine four five, and uh, you know, I I hear a lot about Social Security required minimum distributions, and um, um, all that kind of stuff. Social Security. I should talk a little bit about that because it, you know a lot of people are afraid that it's going to go away. Well, it's not going to go away. Um, the reality is they'll, they're, they probably won't raise Social Security as fast as inflation is going up. Uh, and that actually causes the deficit to go down. Uh, they'll also, if they start to raise their RMDs, they may continue to start raising the age at which you would um, be eligible for full Social Security. So it'd be pretty easy to fix, actually. And not even all that painful. The uh, I think that that's probably going to happen. Yeah, I think it's uh, at some point in time. Um, anyway, I got to take a real quick phone call. Again, if you'd like to call in 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. And uh, John, you're on lookout for the, uh, no, I used to call this lookout for the bull a long time ago. It's the Bullington Capital Report. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Bill. A hey, quick question for you. For yep. uh, an overall nest egg, mm-hmm. let's say you, you're retiring. What percentage of your portfolio do you guys um, need to be sort of in, responsible for? Are there different levels where, let's say you have X number of dollars, what percentage of you want to keep in cash some, you want to keep existing um, stocks, yeah. bonds that you have? Right. What percentage do you sort of, um, require someone to have? Well, we actually let them tell us how much fluctuation they're willing to put up with. And once they do that, uh, you know, so let's say we call it our decline tolerance. What's your tolerance for decline? And there's no right answer for, for everybody. I mean, there is a thing. I think if you're going to make a decent return, you're probably going to be a 65, 35, minimally 65% stocks, 35%, you know, bonds, which are going to be short term in nature. You could use that. This is one of the reasons I've been using a, a fixed index annuity, which I never thought I would be doing. I never thought interest rates would get this low that I'd actually have to rely on something like that. But it turns out that they're pretty good. So, uh, especially in the newer editions uh, of that, but we let the clients, you know, determine that. And, and it's a conversation and it's a tough question to ask, but, Everybody has to figure out how much, it doesn't matter how much money you need to make if you're not going to be there, if you're going to panic and you're going to pull out of the market, yeah, you'll never get the returns. That's why I keep ordering that Dalbar study. That That is a horrible that, strategy. That's not the question. The question is, is out of your, out of your entire portfolio, mm-hmm. I, I've done well, Okay, but I would only want to uh, allow a certain percentage of my portfolio to have to be something I would then allow Bullington Capital to um, control to, to manage or to <laughs> yeah. give direct or right. manage or sure. or give yeah. us give us a, uh, a an idea okay these are the ones we'd like you to to buy some some kind of direction it doesn't yes. have to be what percentage so here's what we would do I would I go I'd go to a client Okay, you're interested in having money managed. How much, uh, when the, the, the money that you're handing me to manage, how much of a decline are you willing to sit through? Because you can't make any money. You can make nothing if you're not willing to watch it fluctuate. 
Well, I shouldn't I say you can't make. I understand. Okay, so when you answer that question, I know exactly what percentage of that account I'm going to put into stocks and how much of it I'm going to put into sh- either short-term bonds or a fixed index annuity if you like that sort of thing. If you don't, no problem. Uh, now, there is a uh, there's a brand new writer that came out with an investment-only annuity. Investment-only annuity is a new thing. This has not been around for very long. Uh, it, there's a rider on there that'll guarantee an income based on the highest levels that the uh, mutual funds ever got to on the anniversary date. So let's say you started with 100,000. Next year it's at 125 because you were 100% in stock. They'll give you an income off of that. It's 4% for an individual, 3.75 for a couple. And they will guarantee that, and you can be 100% invested in stock. And if it goes down, it doesn't matter. They're going to guarantee that income for as long as you both live. And once the, uh, if the mutual funds in there and there's Fidelity, Vanguard, T. Roper, you name it, it's, they're all in there. You can be, you can be hundred percent in stock. Once that passes the high watermark to where you started taking the income, they will actually bump your income up. That is a game changer. That's a, uh, that's a, that is complete. That, that throws in a whole new option that's never existed before into the mix now. So that's going to be hard for an awful lot of people to get their arms around. It took me a couple of weeks because <laughs> I kept thinking I was going, nah, what, what are you doing? Okay. So, uh, it was, uh, yeah, so it, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. But to answer your question, somebody comes in and says, uh, like on my risk decline tolerance questionnaire, the question I have, it's got my age. It's got the amount of money that, I'm, you know, that, that I have in my, net worth uh, or what's ever in that portfolio, depending on what we're doing. And I also have to answer the same question. Everybody else says, how much of a decline are you willing to sit through knowing you're going to have to take a decline to try to make uh, a decent return on your investments? And mine said at 35%. Okay, I'm willing to go through a 35% decline. Why? Because I've seen the S&P 500 drop more than 50% twice in less than 10 years. It happened two times in less than 10 years. So uh, you got to figure if if it can happen twice inside of one 10-year time period, it could happen again. So if you're invested in stocks, there's a good chance you'll be down 50% or more at some point in time. So if you don't want to be down 50%, don't put 100% of your money in stocks. Let's say I want to try to stick to 35 the way that mine is. Okay. I, I'm going to try to limit my stock exposure to 70%. The other 30%, I'm going to use a combination of fixed income. And, and I use the, the nationwide thing, the, the fixed index, a bunch of people have them, but that's just the one I use anyway. So does, does that make sense to you? So I'm going to, I'm going to limit my stock exposure in that uh, across the board at, at 70%. Now, if somebody came in and said, look, Bill, this is a part of my portfolio. I don't, you know, I'm fine being down 50%. Great. You can be hundred percent stock. If you wanted to say, I only want to be, I, I couldn't take, I could, I would be losing sleep if I was down more than 25%. Okay. We're going to go 50% stock, 50% fixed income. Because if that stock gets hit 50% again, you should only be down about 25% or so. And, uh, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. It's sort of kind of um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know if I can sh- share my contact information offline with you. Oh, <laughs> just just oh, you can send it on uh, offline, or you can go to my website. Um, uh, you can call the, the office. The reason I'm asking is I, I I already have seen you once, probably about five years ago. Okay, and I just I couldn't get an answer to that question. Well, that that's uh, the answer. I it I know it's hard, and you see all these questionnaires. By the way, uh, the reason I use the client tolerance. You have to think about it. You have to put yourself through the the exercise. If the market crashes and I'm 100% in stock, there's a really good chance I'm going to be down 50%. Can I take that with this portion of my money? If not, we cannot be 100% in stock. Can't. If it's 20, I'm I'm, I'm not arguing. Yeah, I understand. If if it's 25%, I'm going to go 50% in stock. It's a super. I think my questionnaire is actually easier than the other ones. Have you seen the other questionnaires out there? (laughs) I look at them all the time 
and I'm trying to find one that I think is better than mine, and I just keep coming back and because they don't talk about, okay, what do you do if, if the stock market's down 50%? None of them address that. Not a single solitary one. Well, actually, there's there's one that tried to, but the um, I felt like it, it just fell short. It confused people, and it is confusing. It's something you really have to think about, and people don't like to think about declines. They really don't like to think about that. It's human nature. So having to force yourself to think about that and say, okay, well, what if we had another 2008 and nine on our hands? It started in November, 2007, by the way, mid and small cap stocks started in the first quarter of 2007. So the three, a three year decline, same thing from March of 2000 to March of 2003, three years, over 50% decline. Can you really put up with that? Because you will not be able to see into the future and magically predict when that's going to happen. Or when it's going to be over. So you have to you know, do, you know, so I try to, and by the way, my number is way more conservative than you know, a bunch of firms have these risk tolerance questionnaires I see, and they would have you invested much heavier than you should be because they're, they're saying, well, you know, the worst one year, Hey, who said the stock markets on a one year cycle, there was twice where it was three years. And if you're using the worst one year, great. But what happens when you have two bad years back to back? Then you got a whole bunch of people who are wondering what they're going to do and if they can get a job in retirement because they understated the risk. And that's the entire industry, which really ticks me off. The, uh, I'm mad at the entire industry. And then they want to give a guy like me a hard time <laughs> because I'm small. And I call him out on that. You know, the, uh, and this goes through the biggest firms, even that, the guy that won the Nobel prize, you know, his stuff confusing. The, uh, it's the, there's a big money management firm that bought that stuff and use it every day. And I look at it and I'm like, wow, this is, this is telling people nothing. And I know this, the question that I have seems hard and everybody gets hung up on it. I know they do. A lot of people go home, think about it and never come back, but I have to sleep at night. I've got to know that you know what you're up against. Because, and, and by the way, that's what I want to know. If I were dealing in, with someone like me and I'm out there doing something else with my, I want to know what I'm up against. And there's nothing saying that the stock market couldn't go below, couldn't go farther than 50%, it was down 85% in the, during the depression. Okay. But the, uh, it's been down 50% or more four times in my lifetime. So you got to figure it can probably happen again. And the other risk measures that these other firms are using is 16%. They are woefully understating the actual risk that people are taking. People are out there thinking the worst I can do is 16%. Why? Because somebody showed them a number and didn't explain, it, explain what it was. And I know why they do that, because they're afraid people won't invest if they knew the truth. And by the way, mathematically, they are correct. They're looking at one year and they're looking at standard deviation and they're calling that the risk. It, it, it's inadequate. They need to change that. And what will happen is you're probably going to have most people, instead of having an a, a 80, 20, 80% stock portfolio, they're probably going down to 50, 50. And the amount of money that goes into the stock market would probably be a lot less and they'd earn a lot less in fees. And that that's, you know, that's actually the salty side coming out in me <laughs> because people give me a hard time. I'm trying to do the right thing and they're saying, no, they, this is the right thing. And I'm saying, you guys are ignoring the risk. And one day people are going to see the risk. And one of the reasons the average investor does so poorly is because they're not being shown all the data. They're only showing them a small piece of it and they're not explaining it. So anyway, I feel bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> Does that help at all? I'll, I'll, I think I'll have to, to call you offline. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, and remind you who yeah. I was, and right. who I am, and, right. and who to, that I'd like to talk to you again. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's a lot easier in, in the office with uh, the pictures <laughs> that we have, just the graphs, basically. But uh, yeah, feel free. Um, and if you can call Lee, you can leave a message. It's 330 664 0700. Hey, John, I got to run. I got a commercial break, and, but thanks for calling. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Listen to Bill Bullington. I'll be back after these messages.
And you're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420 every Saturday morning. If you'd like to talk to me, you can always go to my website, BullingtonCapital.com. Just reach out to me there. Our phone number is 330-664-0700. If if you'd like to call me, I just... My brain just stopped working there for a second. Three three zero six six four zero seven hundred. If you'd like to call me and talk to me personally, and I got to tell you, these risk tolerance things drive me crazy a little bit because they are hard. You know, you have to really put some thought into what kind of investor am I really. Nobody wants to think about it. I get it. You know, because it's hard. You have to make a decision. You have to decide what kind of investor you're going to be. And if you're not willing to see your stocks drop by 50% or more, don't put your money in stocks. The, uh, your entire portfolio could go down 50% if you were 100% in stock. I, I remember reading Warren Buffett say that, and so did Peter Lynch, and I thought they were kidding. And uh, this was a long time ago. Man, I can't believe it's been over 30 years. Holy cow. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go uh, go to the phones right now. And uh, Hey, Jerry, how you doing? I haven't heard from you for a while. Hey, good morning, William. Um, got, got a uh, observation I'd like you to comment on. Sure. Uh, much of the business press in the last week has been making it a class warfare battle on the uh, GameStop uh conundrum as far as it's the shorts versus the hedge fund form excuse me the hedge fund so forth and so on could you enlighten me uh, or the audience as far as what's really going on um it's a you stock know? that's been uh, kind of it reminds me of the late 90s when you had a ton of stocks that were doing this and mm-hmm. even microsoft you know microsoft was the GameStop of its day believe it or not and in fact, I'll prove it to you. I'm going to go. I pulled up the uh, long term chart on Microsoft. Microsoft got to a valuation that it was just not worth. I mean, there's no mm-hmm. way you could justify it. It sold for $52.38 a share. Now they split the stock since then, so it was actually much higher than that. But anyway, if you adjust it for splits, in 1999, that stock got up to a price of 52 And it was selling for about, oh, I don't know, probably six times what it should have. Think about that. About six oh, times what it should have. So in 2009, 10 years later, 10 years later, Microsoft was selling, its low price was $14.87. That's Microsoft, one of the best companies that's ever existed. Okay. So it goes from low 50s down to the low teens or mid teens. And that was 10 years later. So mm-hmm. it took it another, it, it didn't surpass and stay above the high price that it reached in 1999 until the middle of 2016. Sure. Yeah. So you're 17 years to recover. And that's because, okay. you know, my, that you're, we're talking about one of the better companies that's of ever course. existed. So if it could happen to Microsoft, you know, are, are people really surprised that it's happening to a, co- a company like GameStop? I, I don't think anyone's surprised as much as I, the social commentary uh, as far as it's one side versus the other. Is that just a bunch of nonsense? The, uh, you know, they're saying, well, the big hedge funds are getting advantage over the little investors and uh, the market has been shut down and it's illegal. Is that just a bunch of fluff or is that uh well, the what's yeah, what's happening? Uh, it, we won't know until it's too late to do anything about it, anyway. And uh, I, 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 de- I wouldn't touch it, uh, but I, I'm just curious. Uh, there's no way of I knowing, was, Jerry. There, there's literally no way of knowing because the uh, hedge okay. funds don't have to tell you what they're buying or selling. It's not a requirement. If you go, if uh-huh. they go above a certain dollar amount, uh, and by the way, there's some private equity funds that don't have to tell anybody squat. So, and there are, uh, they, they control a tremendous amount of money. There are, uh, ETFs out there, uh, ETFs. And here's what's happened over the past six, seven years. Exchange traded funds have grown gigantically. I mean, their growth rates off the charts. They have to own every stock in an index. They have to. In fact, they're going to have to buy and sell every day to keep that, that value up in the index uh, every single day. 
a lot of individual mutual funds are out there. You have variable uh, annuity sub accounts out there. And you've got a, I guess what I'm pointing to is that a ton of the stock is held by institutions. So Mm -hmm. when you get a company that's as small as GameStock, it's not that hard to manipulate. You could get enough buyers together on one of the, uh, on a website used to be AOL back in the nineties, everybody would get on AOL and they would all get these chat rooms and they were causing stocks to fluctuate like that. So it's, it's not a new thing. Uh, and they, they, what happened back in the nineties is a lot of them just got hurt so badly they just never wanted to hear about stocks ever again <laughs> for a lot of individual right. investors but and, and i and i don't even think you know i shouldn't even let that, that's not even funny it, it's it's horrible no, for me no. to watch you know when people are drawn in they don't know what they're talking about they don't know the very first thing they don't know what the company does they don't know what their revenues are they don't know anything about the stock other than this thing seems to be going up really fast okay sure. well there are some ways to make money on that. The hedge funds have can make money on that, but you'd be surprised how poorly the hedge funds do on a lot of that stuff. Oftentimes, it just creates an awful lot of volatility, and nobody wins. Yeah. Well, the stock pools or uh, stock manipulations gone back to the 1920s when Joe Kennedy yeah. did it. I'm very impressed that you know that. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, I, I just was curious. So there's no sides that have been drawn. It's uh, They're trying to make it a big drama as if it is it's one investor against another, the longs and the shorts, rather than uh, the little guy versus the big guy or anything of that nature. Well, most, of the, most of the really, the vast majority of the really big funds are not going to yeah. participate that. There's not enough volume there. There's not enough money involved in there for them to have, to even bother with it. So, I would think. May I ask you one other question? Uh, be real quick. Uh, I had a position in General Motors. I, I was fortunate enough to get out. I doubled my money on it after about four or five years. Um, do you see any future in General Motors going forward, or do you think we... You know, actually, I do. Um, well, and it's in a lot of the ETFs, the, like the large cap ETFs I hold. So I feel good about having it in there. Uh, I really like the fact that the exchange traded fund is is still managed. It's got to meet all the criteria to stay in um, the mm-hmm. fund. So I'm not going to add to that as uh, an individual holding. Uh, they're mm-hmm. just uh, companies like General Motors are incredibly difficult because they're so big. There's mm-hmm. so many uh, there's so many components to just one car. I think I read somewhere a car's got five or six thousand parts on it. And so when you multiply that, you know, by the number of models that they have, uh, of course, they're using a lot of the same parts in different models. But that is that is an incredibly difficult field to be in. And, but mm-hmm. I, I really think that the car manufacturers um, really kind of have their wind at their backs a little bit uh, with the transitioning over all the new technology it makes people want their cars more. So I, I think they'll probably be OK. I don't think there's going to be a lot of new cars. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a, a, a dynamic product. I could be wrong. Uh, that comes out and wants everybody to go and you know turn their old cars in and get a new car right away. But of course. you know the uh, when you look at what General Motors is doing, uh, I, I love their CEO. I think she's extremely practical. And um, you look at the valuation on the company. You look at what's coming up. Some of the projects that they've talked about working on they're definitely looking into the future that that that's encouraging so yeah i i wouldn't put a ton of money in it but i wouldn't mind you know having a position on it and uh yeah i i was underwater for almost two years before i made money on it but it eventually did come back and uh hey i I, talked about the leaps that i had on GameStop two and a half years ago on this program yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. I heard him. <laughs> All right, have man. A nice day, Joe. Thanks so much. All right, yeah, bye bye. Bye bye. Oh yeah, it was the. Uh... <laughs> and by the way, when I bought the leaps on GameStop, I mean, I, I just I got crushed almost immediately. Uh, I just let them expire worthless. Uh, never bought them back again. <laughs> so the uh, yeah, that's how that goes. <laughs> very very difficult. Now, it's not like, and, and this is one of the reasons, by the way, that somebody 
somebody has talked to um, many pe- investment people over the years. I think it was the um, I think God inspired people to do certain things. Uh, I think our Constitution is one of them, and uh, just so clever of these guys. I just don't think humans are capable of coming up with that on their own. <laughs> and uh, humans probably did the uh, uh, diversification thing, but maybe you know, the uh, diversifying is one of the best things that you can do. And, and when I was younger, I really didn't believe in it all that much. Um, I was a lot more. Uh, it was easier back in those days. It was just easier to do. So today. You've got these, you know, stocks can go up and down an unbelievable amount in a single day. So I really think it's important that you diversify. And I think it's important that you have some fixed income out there. And I can't believe my show is actually over. If you'd like to learn more about the fixed side, we'll talk about that on next week's show. And uh, appreciate everybody listening this week. Have a good week. Good investing. Good luck. You just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.